Good morning. Uh, over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about where we've come with uh, ovarian cancer and uh, where we've come with ovarian cancer over the last uh, couple of decades. Okay, this is uh, the original Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center, which was uh, built on the west side of Manhattan. Interestingly, it was uh, the f original founder of Memorial Sloan Kettering was a gynecologist uh, who built this hospital primarily so that he could provide cancer care for women. It was later moved to the east side of Manhattan, and this is our current uh, building located on the Upper East Side. Ovarian cancer is the most frequent cancer that, uh, the tenth most frequent cancer that occurs in women, but unfortunately it is the uh, fourth most frequent cause of death from cancer in women. You can see here, <coughs> this is ovarian cancer, looking at the incidence of the disease. You can see it's nowhere near the incidence of endometrial cancer. But if we look at survival, you can see that ovarian cancer makes up the bulk of the, uh, the deaths from gynecologic uh, cancer being uh, the leading cause of gynecologic cancer death, and therefore extremely important to all of us. You can see that if we look at the common cancers that affect women, uh, there has been over the years a gradual improvement in survival of all of these except endometrial cancer, which has stayed fairly stable. And even though ovarian cancer has the lowest survival rates of all of these cancers, there has been uh, steady progress. Now the problem with ovarian cancer is illustrated by this slide. Uh, the survival for a cancer when it's confined to the ovary is well above uh, 90 percent, and yet relatively few, less than 20 percent of the cancers uh, are found at that stage. Even regional cancers, that is spread somewhere in the pelvis, uh, has a, a fairly decent sur survival rate uh, if it's treated surgically and by chemotherapy. The problem that we have, of course, is that distant survival remains relatively low. In other words, disease that is spread throughout the abdomen uh, still has survival rates uh, overall of around 30 percent. And this is where we most frequently see uh, cancers of the ovary. Ovarian cancer spreads by three routes. It spreads from, by direct extension, in other words, it grows from the ovary onto the fallopian tube, the bowel. It also spreads through the lymphatics, and that must be considered when we're treating the patients. But by far the most devastating type of spread is the exfoliation of clonogenic cells, in other words, cells that escape into the ab abdomen from the cancer and then have the ability to implant wherever they land. And this is what causes the vast majority of ovarian cancers to have spread throughout the abdomen and makes the treatment so difficult. If we look at the strategies for managing ovarian cancer, uh, certainly uh, prevention would be ideal, and I'll show you the few things that we can do in terms of prevention. Screening and early diagnosis has been disappointed we don't have a good screening tool for this disease. Therapy continues to be primarily surgical and by chemotherapy, although we will talk briefly about some new therapies that are coming about. If we look first at screening, CA125, of course, being the most common marker for ovarian cancer, and the problem that we face with CA125 when it comes to screening ovarian cancers is only about half of the early ovarian cancers actually have an elevation in the CA125, uh, while advanced disease has a very high likelihood of having the, the marker advanced. Uh, it's not so reliable in early disease where we would like to diagnose it. If we look at the other method of commonly used for the diagnosis and screening of ovarian cancer, it's ultrasound, either pelvic or transvaginal ultrasound, and looking at this collection from the literature, you can see that uh, out of almost 12,000 patients, 
that were screened in these studies, uh, 486 went to surgery and only 19 cancers were detected. So screening with ultrasound oftentimes results in a lot of operations that do not detect any kind of, uh, of ovarian cancer disease. And we have some fairly good methods for prevention of ovarian cancer. The two most common are the use of oral contraceptives and prophylactic oophorectomy. Oh, this is the use of uh, oral contraceptives or the birth control pill in terms of preventing the disease. And you can see that compared to patients who have not taken birth control pills at all, women who've taken birth control pills from three to six years have a dramatic uh, decrease in the incidence of ovarian cancer. Actually, over five years of oral contraceptive use, it's about half. This is even worthwhile in patients who have genetic abnormalities, indicating the power of the protective aspect of, of oral contraceptives. The other way is to surgically remove the ovaries uh, from high-risk individuals. And when we talk about high-risk individuals, we're talking almost exclusively about patients with BRCA uh, mutations, either one or two. This is a study from my own institution uh, by Noah Koff, in which he looked at 170 women uh, who were known to be positive for BRCA1 or 2. Uh, 72 of those women chose uh, close surveillance, in other words, getting an ultrasound and a CA125 twice a year. The two groups were pretty equal in terms of their family history and their, the, the oral contraceptive use, et cetera. The only real difference was that more of the women who chose salpingoophorectomy, in other words, the group that chose salpingoophorectomy, had already had a prophylactic mastectomy. We look at the long-term results. <clears throat> After almost uh, two and a half years, the patients who actually went ahead and had the surgery uh, developed three, incident, three cases of breast cancer and one case of peritoneal cancer, whereas the, the 72 women who chose to be screened every six months with ultrasound and CA125 uh, had eight breast cancers and four ovarian cancers and one peritoneal cancer, indicating fairly clearly that salpingoophorectomy can almost exclusively eliminate ovarian cancer and certainly decreases the risk of breast cancer. Well, historically in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, surgery was primarily diagnostic. Uh, in those early days, uh, most patients were open to make the diagnosis, but there was no extensive uh, surgical procedure. Patients were then treated with irradiation and then towards the beginning in the 1960s when chemotherapy became available with single agent alkylating agents. In those days, the median survival for stage three ovarian cancer was about 11 months. So in other words, the vast majority of patients died rather quickly. In the 1970s and 80s, the importance of cytoreductive or uh, debulking surgery became uh, became very important when the surgeons began to realize the advantage that it gave to their patients. At that time, we considered optimal debulking to be two centimeters or less. In other words, if you could get out all of the tumor nodules that were larger than two centimeters, then the patient was considered to be uh, optimally debulked based on the skills of that time. Late in the 19 uh, 70s, cisplatin was introduced, and, and then chemotherapy trials began, and for the first time, we began looking at combination chemotherapy uh, using more modern drugs. The role of surgery in the 70s and, and 80s became not only to establish diagnosis, but to completely stage the patient to map out where the tumor was spread and we began to realize the importance of debulking or surgical remover of the tumor. Second look surgery was used to some extent and there were some early papers on secondary cytoreduction. In other words, patients who develop recurrence being operated again 
to try surgical debulking. Surgery, as always, was important in palliation for patients who were uh, near death. The theoretical basis for cytoreductive surgery is based on uh, three principles. You remove a lot of the tumor volume, so in other words, you take the tumor out. The, the tumor that is removed is usually a tumor that has a much poorer blood supply, so therefore the, the, these large masses that the chemotherapy has trouble penetrating, if you take them out, that leaves behind tumor that has a better blood supply and can therefore get more chemotherapy. And we also learned that if you took out the big, rather slow-growing tumors, the small tumors that were left tend to grow more rapidly, which made them much more susceptible to chemotherapy. In the 1990s, there were multiple studies that documented the extreme importance of surgery, of cytoreductive surgery, and we redefined optimal as one centimeter or less of residual disease. One of the first major uh, papers that uh, looked at this surgical debulking was a gynecologic oncology group study, and for the first time, this study showed that not only was there a difference in survival between greater than two centimeters and less than two centimeters, but there was also a significantly greater survival for patients who had all of their tumor removed. This is the, the slide from that study. You can see here there's patients with one or two centimeters. These are patients with larger than two centimeters. You can see the difference in survival. But you can also now see the tremendously improved survival if you're able to take out all of the tumor that's big enough to see. From 1996 to 1999, uh, the surgical practice at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, was based on these previous studies. Beginning in the late 90s, we began to change to become more aggressive, and one of the surgeons at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dennis Chi, looked at the difference in survival between the 96 to 99 period versus the 2001 to 2003 period. If we look at the two groups of patients, this being the group uh, from, from the earlier series, this being the later group, you can see that many more of the patients had extensive procedures, and, the, and, and in this particular paper, extensive procedures were, were defined by removing segments of bowel, the spleen, et cetera. Uh, also, a greatly improved number of the patients had optimal cytoreduction as compared to the earlier group. And as you would expect, there was an increase in the length of surgery and an increase in the blood loss, although relatively little difference between complication rates or length of survival. If we then look at the survival, this is the patients who had the more aggressive surgery, and you can see that there was a clear benefit uh, in survival. And this was one of the first patients that really confirmed that you really should make every effort to get all of the tumor that's big enough to see out, if possible. In the 1990s, uh, cisplatin plus Taxol was proven to be the best uh, chemotherapy. Uh, two decades later, that is still uh, true and has uh, remained the standard. More clinical studies show the importance of cytoreductive surgery, and more and more surgeons began as Dr. Chi did in that study, starting to think that optimal surgery re meant, meant removing everything big enough to see. Then finally, towards the end of that period, uh, the, the gynecologic oncology group published three studies that showed very clearly that in patients with optimal disease, small residual disease, you could get improved survival by using chemotherapy given directly into the abdomen. This is the study that defined Taxol and Platinum as the standard compared to the then standard of Cytoxin. Uh, and this remains today uh, one of the most important chemotherapy regions for ovarian cancer. 2000 and beyond, more studies continued to confirm that the most important thing about cytoreductive surgery was zero residual. 
uh, several centers during this period of time began to get nearly 80% uh, optimal residual and very high rates of zero uh, residual. And despite multiple studies, carboplatin and taxol remained during this decade uh, the, the best primary chemotherapy. Interperitoneal chemotherapy, as I mentioned, was explored uh, extensively by the gynecologic oncology group. These are the three GOG studies by Alberts, by Armstrong, and by Markman, all having uh, several hundred patients. And it was clearly evident from these trials that patients who met the criteria of optimal disease and had their chemotherapy given directly into the abdomen had an improved survival. So where do we go in the future? Uh, one, there have been some studies of the antivascular uh, agents, particularly uh, bevacizumab. It appears to improve progression-free survival, in other words, initial survival, but in the end, overall survival is not dramatically changed. Uh, there was a meta-analysis of four different studies of, bez of bezacizumab, which showed the same thing. This does, however, provide some hope, because it's active, that we may be able to develop some type of biological therapy that will make a significant difference in this disease. So in summary, this is where we've come. Uh, when I first started my ovarian cancer uh, treatment career, uh, our patients died after about 12 months. Today, if they are reduced to optimal disease and get chemotherapy via the abdomen, we can oftentimes get survival in the 60% range. And you can see here that the, the change in the survival and this particular difference here is statistically significant. So where do we go in the future? Well, obviously, we would like to have newer and, and better drugs. We would like to be able to develop some ability to screen the disease, even if not in all patients, at least in high-risk women. And hopefully, there will be genomic discoveries that will allow us to target the individual tumors, because we know increasingly that tumors between individuals may be very different in their response to different drugs. Thank you very much.